Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Williams, and you are either listening or perhaps watching another episode of Retail Redeveloped. Now, I'm going a little fanboy today. I'm not going to lie. I am about to interview Rick Wittenbracker. Got it? Chief Marketing Officer for Howler Brothers. Now, why am I going to fanboy out? I am not only rocking a Howler Brothers shirt right now, I'm also rocking a Howling, Howler Brothers uh, pair of Horizon 2.0 hybrid shorts. They're my favorite shorts. They're an awesome brand. Um, I, and I can't wait to hear kind of how they got started and, and where they are now. Like I said, I'm a fan first, and, and, and I can't wait to hear what these guys have to say. Rick, do me a favor. Introduce yourself. Tell people who you are you know, how you got started, how you got started with Howler, and just tell a little, tell a little bit about, uh, about how you came to sit in the seat that you're in now. Sure. Well, first off, thanks for having me. Uh, this is really a fun thing for us to get to do. Um, my name is Rick Wittenbreaker. I am uh, the CMO for Howler Brothers, and we're an Austin-based uh, men's uh, apparel brand. And um, I've done a lot of different things. Uh, from a work perspective, but I, I've now been at Howler for seven and a half years. And uh, before that, uh, I've worked at Yeti. I ran marketing for Yeti before that. Um, and prior to that, I did a whole lot of other things, several startups um, and uh, commodities and private equity and all kinds of weird stuff all over the, all over the globe. So, um, but it all sort of, for me, uh, when I started doing some consulting work for Yeti, it was uh, the first time that my hobbies ever collided with my work. And it really opened up my eyes to like, oh my gosh, this is actually like, there, there's a lot of business to be had here. Um, and, you know, it's the stuff I want to be talking about anyways. So um, it, it made it, it made it pretty darn easy to jump in, even if the work was serious. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and so Howler was started uh, in 2010 uh, by my two partners, uh, or two of my partners, Chase Hurd and Andy Stepanian. Uh, and they, along with another one of our partners, Mason Brant, all uh, met in college at UVA and started a band at UVA and uh, they actually, the band is still going and they're still playing and it's called the Wrinkle Neck Mules. And, um, and so what it gave them though was this awesome, and they, and they have been pretty successful and have put out, I think eight albums or something and spent a few years in there where they were touring. Uh, they've played in Europe, they've done all this cool band stuff. Um, but what it gave them was this background of creative collaboration. And then on top of that, the sort of pressure test of, you know, endless trips on the road and endless hours in the van and all. So they had already honestly worked out a lot of the kinks uh, of like interaction and working together before the idea of how there ever came to be. Um, and, uh, and the long story short is that uh, Chase was uh, a fine art painter. Uh, he's one of the most creative, talented people you'll ever come across. Um, so he was a fine art painter and had his works in galleries and was hired to do, you know, giant murals and all this cool stuff. Um, and then he decided he wanted to be an architect so he went to grad school here in Austin for architecture and right. uh, became a practicing architect for a few years. Uh, and and all, all this while in parallel, the band is still going and traveling and playing. and um, Totally linear career path. Like all that yeah. makes perfect yeah, right. sense. Fine art, murals, architecture, horizon board shorts. Like totally good. Yeah. <laughs> well, in this weird way, uh, it, it now sort of you know hindsight 2020 it kind of does all make sense because they're right. all uh you know the confluence of all those things um combined to give us i think uh, a perspective and a creative background that 
you can't replicate. Right. Um, you know, nobody, nobody else has founders that were, are, you know, played music together, were also in fine art, then became an architect. Uh, and, and the whole, uh, the, you know, just the, the sum of all of those things add into what we do and what is Howler as a brand and the products that we put out and the experiences we try to share. And so um, it's really cool and it's really fun for us. And it, um, you know, frankly, it makes my job pretty damn easy when there's so much horsepower behind it. Well, so I want to get in everything that you're saying. I'm, I'm sitting here feverishly writing down notes of things that I want to ask you. But before, you know, I really nerd out, tell everybody, because not everybody uh, uh, on the, in the, in the Southeast um, is as familiar with you guys are, as, you know, certainly, you know, Texas and, and some other markets that you guys just dominate. Do me a favor, just give, just encapsulate the brand, what you guys stand for, who you are, what your mission is. Just tell people a little bit about sure. what Howler is, what, what you guys do and, and what kind of sets you apart, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, so Howler, um, I think the, maybe one of the best ways to describe it is, um, you know, on, on a very basic level, we make uh, outdoor apparel for guys. You know, but um, what where I think we're a little different and what sets us apart and and how we got started was uh, really that um, we have all these creative influences that we discussed. Um, but on top of that, um, Chase and Andy and and the rest of us have always loved doing all these uh, outdoor pursuits. Uh, surfing and fly fishing, uh, especially on the ocean um, and things like that. You know, th those are all these passions that never really leave you, even when you're away from, you're not doing them. It's what you're thinking about. It's what you look at right. on Instagram. It's all that stuff, right? And, and so, um, but all those things historically have had all this like hard work technical gear and their clothes are always sort of overbuilt and over designed and sure they perform but you kind of feel like uh, a dork or you know like uh, yep. you know yep. it, like oh i wear this stuff totally to get do it. the activity but the minute i get off the boat or the minute i step out of the water i'm like Ugh, i feel like i'm in an act not going to the bar or, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and so um we're, you know one of the things that we have said since day one is that uh, our stuff needs to work just as well in the bar as it does on the water. And so you shouldn't have to go back to your room and change. You know, you ought to feel like, no, this kicked ass out when I was out there doing what I was doing. And now we're just going to hang and great. Uh, you know, I love the way it looks. And even if today I'm not going to do any of those activities, I'm just living my life, then Heck yeah, I love the way it looks and feels. And and so we always wanted the, to have, I think, the technical DNA of a lot of those things. Um, but we don't lead with that. We, we lead with design and aesthetic. We don't lead with the technical bullet points. And, uh, you know, we're not trying to shove all these. Uh, we're definitely not a man versus nature offering. Uh, we're way more about uh, having a great time with your friends. Um, and in fact, it's a big part of why uh, our name is Howler Brothers, plural. Uh, we, we believe that the best moments and memories are these shared experiences. And it's not about me. It's not an ego thing. It's not look what I did. Look at the mountain I conquered or the fish I caught. It's way more about us and the moments in between and those shared experiences. Because the truth of the matter is, like, we believe that that's what you remember most about a great trip, you know? And it's the funny things that happened and getting a flat tire in the middle of the road in Costa Rica or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And it doesn't, it's not that, oh, 
we reached the pinnacle of the mountain or that we, you know, it was actually this one wave I caught or this fish I caught or whatever it is. I mean, it really is about the sum of the moments that you have with your friends or family or whoever you're traveling with. So walk me through, uh, and again, uh, Howler's been around north of 10 years now. I want to get into the anniversary and I want to get into the evolution of, of how the brand has changed. But before that, you, you mentioned you, you guys make clothes that are that are built for a lifestyle or lifestyle pursuits or, or, or doing active things. How do you get that across? Like everybody wants to, quote, sell a lifestyle right now. Like I, I literally, I was at the RH mansion the other day and their whole thing is they, they want to convince you to spend, not to say that you guys would, are, this is what you're trying to do, but they want you to buy into the RH lifestyle in order for you to buy that couch that is obscenely expensive, right? Yeah. They're selling a, this yeah. ecosystem, right? So yeah. how, do you guys, how do you guys look at that? How do you think about you know, getting the lifestyle to pop when somebody is, is walking through a boutique or walking down the street and sees your, sees your brick and mortar? or sees you on Instagram? Like, like, how do you sell that dream and that lifestyle? Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, it's something that we're always working on and trying to evolve. Um, and I will say too, that in this day and age, we have more, the, the average consumer is way more aware and educated than they ever have been. I think they're more, uh, they're more familiar with things that 10 or 20 years ago we weren't familiar with, you know, 20 years ago, nobody used the word brand unless right. you're talking about cattle. No yeah. one used the word, you know, uh, lifestyle in the, in the way that we're talking about lifestyle. Um, and, and so I think that there are these words like those and a few others that have really come into the, the public uh, usage way more than ever. Um, and there's a lot of people, uh, it's never been easier to start a company. It's never been easier to uh, try and get things made. And so, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is uh, thriving. And I, I actually had this conversation yesterday with somebody, um, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't, the average person didn't know someone who had started a a brewery or a spirits right. brand or some food brand or an apparel brand. And now a lot more people have a first degree connection there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think even that, like people are more aware of brands and aware of products where before it was just a solution. Uh, I, I need a shirt today. I kind of don't, you know, I want it to look nice, but I'm, I'm less like in tune with, the, you know, what the, the, these two companies and their two different shirts and what each one represents or what they're purporting to represent. So uh, like for me, I think now, if we jump ahead to, to who we are, where we are, like we're really, like, you know, I was describing how we love to embrace this, this idea of these shared moments and these times together and, the little details. Um, and one of the, one of my favorite, a friend actually called this out, but you know, when you go to a really awesome restaurant and they have really thought of all these details um, or maybe a hotel or something. And, and the fact that all these little things are considered. Mm -hmm. And, and so you take that and you're like, God, man, it's just awesome. They have, they just, you, you just, Everything you works. A vibe. Everything yep. works, and it and it looks great. And it feels great. It kind of makes you feel like you're on vacation, even if you're not. Um, and then, so take all that detail and attention to detail and and curated like perfection. And then, on the flip side, you take the old, you know, super salty dive bar that hasn't been touched or considered in 50 years but is but equally as special it. for different reasons equally yeah. As special yeah. yeah and equally as emotional about why you love being there and, and and they got crap on the walls that hadn't been updated in 30 years you know the jukebox hasn't been changed in 22 years and all that stuff and but you love it all the same right. and so we're i think 
from one perspective, we try to pull from both of those sides. Both of those things, though, have a very emotional connection. And so for us, we're always trying to tap into the emotion of, you know, doing the things you love with the people you love, hopefully in a place you love. And it's not that we all do that every day or we live some perfectly curated Instagram life. It's really more about those are the, the moments that I hold on to that I want and I want to get back to. Can't wait for that upcoming trip or, you know, time with my friends or whatever it is. And so that's really what we're trying to bottle up and then broadcast out. That makes so much sense. So let's talk, walk me through kind of uh, how you started versus where you are now. Obviously, you guys are growing like crazy. Uh, and then I'd, I'd love to understand a little bit about how you look at the business and how you prioritize the business. Like I, I bought this shirt directly from your website, but I also saw your stuff for the first time in a really cool outfitter store in Charlotte. So you know, how do you guys look at brick and mortar versus sure. just just crushing your online presence? Uh, I, I'd love to start there, and then then I'll have a couple follow up questions based on sure. on on your answer. Well, uh, so the initial thought was, hey, this is going to be really streamlined, and we're going to sell direct only. Um, and that was, you know, in late 2010 when they launched, and it was. Uh, and that was the path, um, but it was very soon after that all these shops started knocking and saying, hey, we want to carry this. And they hadn't even, yep. at that moment, they hadn't even really figured out, well, can we do wholesale? Does wholesale work? How do we go do that? What, you know, what are the other considerations we need to factor in versus what we're doing today? So they went and, uh, and this is before I got there, but they, they went and dove into that and said, yeah, let's do this and let's let's really find we're not going to try and get in every shop. We really want because our, our attitude has always been, hey, and if you look at our stuff or you follow us, like you it's it's not too difficult to, you know, arrive at the determination that this this may not be for everybody. That shirt you're right. wearing right now is not for everybody. But it is right for a lot of people and we want to find those people. So we want to be in the right, with the right people. We want to be in the right shops for us. We're not just trying to shove. It's not just right. a sales channel. And so we want to find the right shops. And so when we, when they dove into the wholesale, uh, it was really about like, okay, let's do this and let's, let's figure out the best way to grow the business and the brand by doing this. And we believe that a big part of that is finding the right people. Um, so the right stores, the right people within those stores, the right locations. And so it really did become, uh, and it makes sense when you zoom out because, you know, we're talking it, the people who really get excited, the store owners or the, buy, the store buyers who really got excited about Howler were the people we're trying to connect with anyways. So in some, right. to some degree, we had done our job and found those people. Now they just look different than an average consumer. They also right. run the shop. And so we're like, well, we should, we should embrace that. Um, and so, and then the wholesale side grew uh, pretty tremendously and then ended up eclipsing the direct business. Wow. Uh, and this was several years ago. Uh, and is it and still, still that trend? Is, is that trend holding? Um, no, our direct business has now uh, surpassed wholesale. It's the lion's share of, uh, like from a revenue standpoint. But um, but we still are in, I think it's like 650 shops or something. Wow. Um, and, you know, that's, I would say that that collection of, of locations is always evolving a little bit. Um, especially with 2020 and all the craziness that happened uh, with COVID, but yeah, I, I, um, I would assume that exacerbated the the direct channels, right? Like, I mean, people yeah, are still buying did. stuff, but that's right. And and I think like a lot of brands, I mean, we benefited from a lot of that traffic moving online, right. but uh, and we've had a lot of these discussions at at a at a partner and you know uh, 
strategic level, but uh, over the past year and a half. But um, we we still believe that uh, being in retail shops is a is a is a pretty darn important thing. Um, I mean, number one, it's a discovery yeah. platform for the people who don't yet know about us, right? They they're just going. They're in this place, going into this shop. They see it. If they like our shirt, then great. We we you know that that's their first touch point. Um, but I think, and if we're picking the right shops with the right people, then we're, we're doing a good job of finding those people, uh, those end users. Um, but I think really uh, with Howler versus, you know, in contrast to other brands out there, we're a very design forward uh, brand mm -hmm. in all regards um, and the product uh, especially. And so when you can really see a lot of our stuff in person, uh, especially if you're on the earlier uh, side of that, uh, you know, cycle, then people, it's you. You get your hands on it. You get to see it in person. You know, both the shirt you're wearing and the shirt I'm wearing. If you just looked online, it might be a little intimidating, or you might be like, "Man, I don't, I don't get that." It, you know, but I think in reality when you see them in person and you get your, your hands on them, you're like, actually, the shirt's kind of badass. I think I should rock that this weekend, you know? Um, and so I, I think it's, uh, a, it's an important thing. And, and, and for a lot of people, I think they find us in these retail shops and like anything, and it's like, okay, now they know us. And then, so maybe they're, they have comfort with buying online, but also that, you know, they might, only have comfort buying online for the things that are maybe a little more middle of the road and for the funkier right. stuff. And we love doing funky stuff that they still might want to see it in person. Well, the, the easiest example is, I mean, we keep, we keep, you know, mentioning the shirt. I feel like the shirt, this might have to be my new podcast shirt with as much traffic as it's getting on this, on this thing. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I went to great outdoor provisions company, which is an awesome outfitter. Awesome so shop. cool. I mean, they have everything from, you know, kayaks to cooking stoves to shirts, right? And they had this shirt, but they had it in like, uh, I don't know, some some funky size. But I saw it and I was like, that shirt's badass. I need to have that shirt. And I knew what size. So I go and order it directly from you. But I probably wouldn't have to your point if I just saw it online, because it just didn't, it doesn't pop online the way it popped in person. So my question to you is, that is such a hard thing to measure for a professional brand, right? We call it everything from halo effect to cost per acquisition of a customer, yada, yada, yada. Like how in the world do you guys navigate the data, right? Like there, without you and I talking, you would have had no idea that the reason I bought this specific shirt is because I bought it in Great Outdoor Provisions Company. Great Outdoor Provision Company has no way of understanding that they would have gotten a cut of this shirt if they would have had my size. So like the data is good as digitally native direct consumer brands are about data. I feel like we're still in the early innings of just trying to figure out how the hell customers are behaving right now. Is yeah. this something that keep as, as CMO, is this something that just like keeps you up at night or did you guys all already figure um, it out? No, yeah, we already got it figured out. It's all like patented <laughs> technology. I can't share with you, but um, no, like the, look, the truth is that um, you know, again, like GOPC is probably not loving that you figured it out on their behalf and yeah. then went and ordered from us. But that being said, like you did establish, and you just said it on the on a second ago that. It is a killer shop. They do a great job of, you know, sourcing all these awesome products and brands and things that maybe you hadn't seen and they pull it all in one place and it, it gives you a great vibe. So they're doing a good job of the shop. The fact that they were out of your size in that shirt, that's, that's sort of life in retail. But yeah. I also think, you know, what we try to do and empower a lot of uh, our, our retailers is, uh, to stay on top of that. And so yeah. if, if, and they can do fill in orders or they can do, uh, you know, we can try and help them. Our, our attitude is not like you bought this from us. 
wash our hands and good luck, give us our money. That's not how we look at it. We look at it like, hey, to some degree, these people are, you know, being our representatives out there. They're our partners out there. So we need to empower them the best way we can. And we're a small company and we don't have all the resources under the under the sun to be able to do everything we want to do, but we sure try and do it with service and with uh, opportunities to reorder and stuff like that. And, and, you know, making sure that we have a uh, up-to-date real retailer locator on our website. So when you're in Charlotte or wherever, and you are, you're in a, you, you know, you're traveling to a different place and you're saying, okay, now I'm in Cleveland. What, who in Cleveland carries this? Cause I want to go find some. Um, and so, we, you know, we're always trying to do what we can on that front. Um, but I will, I will tell you that as far as the, you know, the, the data and tracking that you referenced, I mean, when it's online, we get a, we get a lot more information, right? A lot and of data. Don't, and we know what you've bought from us. We don't know what you've bought from shops. Now, that being said, and I don't know that, you know, casual apparel that we're making, we may never fully get there. And that's, you know, I I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Would we like it to be better? Sure. But it's not necessary for us, at least, it's not going to change the design inspiration. And it's, you know, we look at the aggregate numbers and understand that that shirt you're wearing you know, we sold through this many and it did well in these regions, didn't do well over here or whatever. Um, so, you know, we, we try and, and pour all that into the cauldron and, and, and decipher what we can from it. Um, there are products and uh, brands out there and, and that can do a better job of linking the two. Mm-hmm. And I think it, a lot of it has to do with the, the price and the value and what is the product. Um, so, uh, you know, a good example of this is uh, when I was at Yeti, we, we were trying to tackle this exact same thing. And we had something more tangible in the warranty that we were trying to validate. And so um, what we effectively did was, you know, set up a thing on the website so that even if you bought your cooler at a retail shop, it, it, we included in the the, um, the buyer's guide that comes in the um, inside the cooler when you get it and the owner's manual, uh, we called it. And then, you know, that we, we went from having, not having this and we could only really track it if you bought from us to then saying, right. hey, even if you bought it at this shop, we love and support that shop but come online and register your cooler online. That way we know where you bought it and it helps inform us about, you know, you know, if there's something wrong, did they, did a lot of those, you know, damaged products go to the same shop or it helps us understand those things and track data, data better. But, you know, it's not necessarily something that, if you go buy a hat and t shirt in a shop in Miami, you, you, no one's going to go register that in reality. So, no. but we're okay with that. Um, you know, so I, I think if we were making, um, oh, let's say coolers, or uh, my friend Kansas has a business uh, called Pack Mule, and they sell an $800 really incredible hitch basket you put in the back of your, you know, your trailer hitch. And, put additional gear and stuff in there. And so he's gear, selling yeah. it, but it's a big item and it's an expensive item. And so- And you don't want it to break. Uh, yeah, so no, you're gonna yeah, register. Well, and it's, yeah, it's really bomber, but you want him to say, okay, I paid for this and I, I'm, I'm in, but I, I wanna make sure that like, I'm, I'm tracking the warranty and it, you know, everything's like, yep. I'm, they know that I bought it too. And, it, and, it, and it's yep. in a lot of ways that I'm now, okay, I bought it at this shop. Even if I had never heard of it before I walked in there, I bought it. Now I want to register it because I'm also now in the circle. I'm in the family and right. I want to be a You're part tribe, of that. Yeah. I want to understand. Yeah. So um, I think there's other, there's a lot of instances where that, that sort of setup 
uh, can really work. There's some uh, where if you're buying from a, a third party shop, a, a, one of our hats, like you're probably never going to do that. Now, I will say right. that, um, and, and retailers probably don't want to share that data with us because what if they bought a hat, one of our hats and a camping stove, like it's hard to parse all that out. But, uh, right. you know, when they buy from our shops, we have two stores here in Austin. We do know that. And it is all synced up. It's a common system. And so uh, we can actually pull up all your old orders and say, oh, well, you ordered last time you ordered a large shirt. You know, so let's we can pull up all your orders. You know, we could process a return right there. So talk to me about, I mean, I know you guys have two stores in Austin that are true brick, brick and mortar stores. And then you, you have a presence in, in many, many more 650 or some odd, mm -hmm. you know, how has the pandemic, you know, changed, shifted the way that you guys look at brick and mortar? Um, you know, has it made you believe more in brick and mortar because there's been such a resurgence or does it make you more shy about brick and mortar as a, as a strategy and as a channel uh, than you, than you were before? Um, I think from a wholesale perspective, we're still very much, like I said before, we're very much believe that this is a discovery platform and that people, uh, great shops that do a good job of, you know, putting things out there and running a good, being a part of that community, then we want to be in those stores. Right. Uh, on the, on the, on our branded shops, like our owned shops, uh, you know, we had a, we, we, our first store was on the front of our office. And right. So we did it as sort of our, you right. know, uh, our, our outreach into the, the world, yeah. billboard, uh, so to speak, billboard. Um, and it went great. And I'll, I'll, even though it was a tiny little shop, like it, it completely over delivered. And so right. we said, Hey, let's do more of these. And that branded retail was really taken off. And there's a lot of companies that dove in now in retrospect too aggressively right i'd say even bar the pandemic like they went from having zero to having 27 and now they really weren't set up with infrastructure to maintain that um right but i think what what everyone has found is uh it, it's such a great way to connect with people and to have a physical presence and to be there and that it it doesn't even really displace being in other shops or being in online. And so uh, we went- Well, and, and some of it's about our, immersion, right? Yeah, 100%. And especially for someone like us, that's very much design driven and we want to get completely immerse Aesthetics, you in the lifestyle. Howler atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that for us involves a lot of things. It's, it's the, you know, the music we're playing in the shop and all the, uh, you know, the centric stuff we have hanging in the shop. It's not just product. You know? Right. Um, yeah. Well, and for, and going back to a past yeah. life, I mean, Yeti, I mean, the, the, you know, flagship store in Austin. I mean, if, if you don't walk out of there with, with something that says Yeti on it after, after then, uh, mm -hmm. then you're, you're a stronger man than I, I mean, it, they've done it. They've done an incredible job as well about, immersion into that lifestyle and into that experience. And I, I think you guys do that as well. Um, talk to me about like the dirty word in direct to consumer online, which is returns. Like my, my wife is notorious for buying something in three sizes and returning two of them. Oh, yeah. And I know that's something that, that every retailer is struggling with. Like a, how do you guys deal with it? B like, how is it sustainable? Everybody wants free shipping. Everybody wants it tomorrow. Uh, yeah. And everybody now is, yeah. is just like, oh, I don't worry about it. I'll buy five of them. I'll return four. And it's no big deal. Like, like how, how do you, I don't, because I forget to return stuff and, and then I end up eating it. Uh, but, but how do you guys manage that? And, and how do you plan for the future? Yeah. You know, that's a really interesting topic. Uh, I mean, it's something that we deal with. Uh, and we're constantly trying to make it a better experience for the, our customers, but also like, how do we get smarter about it? And how do we, how do we mitigate this? Um, and so some of it, there's a lot of 
ingredients into that topic. Um, you know, the, the first one about buying multiple sizes or multiple colors and keeping one and returning the rest, um, you know, part of that gets to who is your shopper? Um, and so for us, we see that more upfront, especially if somebody is new or if they've maybe, right. maybe they've lost weight and they're, they're trying to figure out if they go from a large to a medium, you know? Uh, and, and, and so for the most part though, and I'm being very, I'm generalizing here, but, um, uh, I think it's, we, we only make men's, really men's apparel. Uh, so we're targeting guys. Most guys don't really love to shop. They love, they, they actually right. would prefer to don't buy. Don't want the hassle. And, and it is a, it's a, uh, it's a task that I need to fulfill and solve. Not, um, not the sort of uh, perusing of uh you know that right. a lot of people other people might do so the hobby that uh, is female shopping yeah i mean and it, it's it, maybe there's things you know there, there are times and and things you buy where maybe you do that more but uh i think with guys in apparel especially we're not talking about tuxedos or you know something like that so it is like oh i figured out my size okay now I can get over that hurdle and I don't have to mess with size exchanges anymore. Yep. You know, I might get something to realize, well, I don't like it as much as I thought I did when I saw it online. Okay. Or, or maybe there's also, you know, we have different cuts like you and I were talking about before uh, we started taping that, you know, we, we make shorts and different styles of shorts and they have different inseam lengths. And so, yep. You know, you get a pair and you have one style from us and you love it. And then you get another style that it maybe has the longer inseam and you, you, you really like it. But I don't know, man, I just have short legs. And, and fit, you ask any apparel brand, fit is like the unsolvable Rubik's Cube. King. Um, yeah. Fit, fit is the unsolvable Rubik's Cube for most apparel brands. Um, and so you can solve it different ways. We try to solve it up front with information. We try to solve it with pictures uh we try to solve it with uh, descriptions and things but you know at the end of the day if you took 10 guys who are 5'10 180 and line them all up they're all shaped differently you know and so yep. it's real it's a really hard thing to do so we, we 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 do our best and we're constantly evolving that over time and improving and tweaking fit uh tops and bottoms and but you know it's uh we try we try to guide people to shepherd people the best we can there uh but that's another ingredient that speaks to returns and then you know we're always uh service is another thing that is a major component of returns and exchanges and and we like anybody we try to automate that and make it easy on you as a consumer as much as we can um, but you know, stuff doesn't always work out. So how do we be, how do we have a good attitude about it? How do we be helpful about it? And how do we at least let you walk away thinking, well, man, they were super nice and that was easy. And so I like them, even if, you know, I decided to return or exchange those shorts. And to your point, so, you want people to be part of the tribe and part of the yeah part of what you guys are doing. So just, just because one thing didn't work out, doesn't mean they're not going to buy five other things because to your point, yeah. the fit is the hardest thing to figure out, but it's also the Holy grail. Like if I know that I can buy a large from you guys and it's going to fit me and I don't have to think like I'm only going to buy your stuff for a while. Right. Yeah. Yep. It's just takes right. to your point that hurdle is just kind of done. And, and so it, it is a pain in the ass, but if you nail it and, and you happen to fit a guy just right, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have a fan and he's going to tell a bunch of other people about it. Um, well, so Rick, you've, you've been extremely gracious with your time, you know, CMO of a growing apparel brand. You've got a million fires to put out, tell people 
before before I let you go, how they can connect with the Howler Brothers ecosystem, you know, how they can connect with you guys, how they can find out more about what you're doing and, and just kind of become part of the tribe. Yeah, well, um, I'm, you know, I first, I just thanks again for having us on. It's, it's always fun to get to talk about these things. Um, the best way to get involved is, uh, I'd say, on come to our website, howlerbros.com. Uh, on the, every platform, we're also Howler Bros. Instagram uh, probably has the best uh, taste of, you know, a quick, you can digest it pretty quickly and get a, a flip, you know, a taste of what is the Howler Brothers flavor and, um, and give us a follow. I mean, we, we work really hard to, to uh, deliver what is, we, we believe a, a good stream of content. And it's not just trying to shove people to the cash register. We want you to really like it and enjoy it and be interested in what we're putting out there. Um, and, and look, this goes back to kind of what we were saying earlier is that we want people to want to hang out. If yeah. this were a clubhouse, we want them to hang out in the clubhouse. It's not so much about just trying to get them to whip out their credit card. Um, yep. we, we're trying to pull them in, not push them. And so if we can, you know, we think it's our job is to do, you know, put out great products. And that, that's great by quality and by design and aesthetic and originality and creativity. And then also, you know, the content and then the service. And so we're trying to do a great job at all those things and pull you in uh, and have fun while we're doing it. Um, you know, so, uh, and then if you're in Austin, hopefully soon here, we're going to start having more events. Uh, we've been sort of on a hiatus uh, but we love throwing parties and events. And so if you're in the Austin area, uh, and we usually will broadcast this out on socials, but, uh, we'd love to have you drop by one of our events. And, um, yeah, I, I went into the store oh, in uh, Austin. It was, it's a, it's a great it store. It's a great store. I was there. I was there a few weeks yeah, ago, cool. uh, and, and, and had a lot of fun. All right. A couple quick knee jerk questions. Uh, quick, quick response, no thinking, just, just bust it out, uh, that I always like to end in a podcast with just, just real quick off the cuff. What's the hardest lesson you guys have had to learn, uh, over the course of this 10 year ride? What's something that it, it could be the most expensive lesson or the hardest lesson that you guys have learned and, and but it's made you stronger. Yep. Uh, I think the easiest answer to that is that, uh, Nobody cares about your business as much as you do. And Fact. so you have partners and you're always working to find great partners, uh, you know, and that's in retailers. Like we talked about, it could be in uh, manufacturing. It could be in, uh, you know, supply chain fulfillment, whatever it is, but it is, it's a fool's errand to think that the next person or your, the other company you're working with, is going to care as much about your business as you do. So therefore, I think communication and uh, staying on top of things is is paramount to you know achieving any level of success. What what's next? What's the next big thing you guys are working on that you that you can talk about that'll have um, they'll have people that's in the in the tribe excited? Yeah. So uh, this is our we're celebrating our 10th anniversary this year and if you've watched us this spring we released a bunch of uh we've reissued 10 of our uh most requested gaucho snap shirts um and we got to do it in a really fun way so we not only reissued them we, we kind of tweaked each one just a little bit so it's not just a the exact same as the previous issue um and then we got we we tapped some uh people in the Howler family to do little reveal videos for us. And we were fortunate enough to get to, we had some of our brand ambassadors, but then we also got uh, Daniel Norris, who's a uh, pitcher for the Detroit Tigers. And we got uh, Matthew McConaughey and we got Jimmy Kimmel, all who are fans of the brand and sort of friends of the brand. Nice. Uh, and so we, we got to do some fun stuff with them. Uh, we also have some awesome stuff coming uh 
around our 10th anniversary. Uh, we have some cool things we're coming out with this fall, that, uh, some things we've never done before, uh, non-apparel things. It'll be really cool. Um, we're also okay. really happy. Nice teaser. That, yeah, and uh, we're really happy that um, – uh, Austin City Limits Festival is back on and happening this year, so we're uh, we're happy to. This is this will be our fifth uh, round of collaboration with ACL Fest, and we're really fired up to get that stuff out and to to be back going to live concerts. Um, and then uh, the festival have, is going to be huge, man. People, yeah, there's so much pent up awesome. demand. A hundred percent, and and we have some other collabs coming out in the in the next, call it six weeks. Um, there's one coming next week. It's really cool, uh, and then another one coming in uh, probably about a month uh, with a new. Awesome. Yeah, we're really fired up about this one. It's uh, a new. Well, I'll leave it. I can I'll tell you want to say it, but you're not going to say do. it. I want to say it. I want to say it. It's it's a it's a it's a big exciting thing for Austin, and uh, and we're really fired up and and it's a cool fun approach to something that uh, we've never done before. So it's cool. Awesome. Well, I, I won't I won't twist your arm. I can tell that you want to say it, but but you'll be mad after you do it. So I'll let it go. Last last uh, knee jerk question: uh, If people are out there listening and, and and they're not like me, they're not already fanboys. What what's one What's the first thing that they have to buy? Uh, what what what's always the fan favorite? What's always the 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 hook that you guys have for gear? Uh, well, I, yeah. So I would say one of the one of the items we're most known for is our Gaucho Snap shirt that I mentioned a minute ago, and we uh, you know drawing a lot of vintage Western inspiration, uh, and we do a lot of fun embroidered yokes on those, uh, and so that's something that everybody loves i love those um i'd say that's a must have my favorite is our board shorts uh, mm -hmm. we make a ton of awesome board shorts and now and with tons of, we have a whole variety of different um uh, i think my, my internet cut out there for a second but we have a variety of styles tons of crazy prints and colors and things and now that we're in, you know, in the thick of summer, I think it's a perfect thing to wear. Uh, I mean, here in Austin, we wear them almost every day. And then, but if you've never been involved with Howler before, I would tell you to uh, sign up for the email so you see all the stuff we're dropping, you know, in the coming months. But start with a hat. We make badass hats. And we have a whole variety of styles and colors and materials and types. And uh, I mean, uh, we, Rick, we I have, told you one piece of gear and, and, and you've sold the entire catalog. So you, you not, totally cheated that question I'm just sorry. for the record. I can't help it. All right, Rick, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I just love hearing and talking and frankly, learning from people that are on the cutting edge of this business. It's so important. It's such an exciting time for retail. Uh, the fact that I can be sitting in Charlotte, North Carolina, talking to you guys in Austin and being so excited about your growth and, and, just, and just having such interesting brands that, that appeal to such a diverse uh, group of people. It's so much fun. Rick, thank you for taking a minute and, and talking with me and, and sharing a little bit about you guys' story and your brand. Yeah, well, thank you so much. We're really grateful. And uh, you know, to everybody out there, Go support your local retailers. Uh, it's an important part of uh, the economy. It's an important part of, uh, you know, getting out there and interacting with people. So go do it. And uh, thanks again for having us. Absolutely. My pleasure.